Thank you very much. Well, um, just back from a week of uh, strategic dialogues in South Korea and Japan, uh, General Brom is head of the Israeli-Palestinian Relations Program at INSS. Um, he joined the Jaffe Center, which uh, the INSS sort of grew out of the Jaffe Center, uh, if you will, after a long and very distinguished career in the IDF. Uh, Shlomo is a foremost Israeli expert on Israel's national security doctrine, and one notable item, I would say, in his biography is that he was a member of the Meridor Committee to examine Israel's security strategy. Shlomo. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I am not going to speak about the reasons for the outbreak of the Arab Spring, of the uprisings in the different Arab states, and I am not going to speak about the domestic implications of them. Uh, what I want to try to do in my comments is uh, to build a bridge between the fascinating analysis of uh, Professor Sasser uh, and possible implications of these dramatic events in the Arab world on foreign policies, strategic postures, alliances, the things that uh, we are going to, to engage with in uh, this conference. But Starting to do it, I immediately run into a problem. I have to, to be engaged in predictions. And to make predictions in this uh, kind of chaotic situation is extremely difficult. So, excuse me for some mistakes that certainly I will do. But I think it's possible to, to, to start making comments on these implications because we are sti starting to see some contours of the possible implications on foreign policies. We are starting to see some modes of behavior of these states in transition. And I'll start with a first comment that I think is quite evident, and that is that the so-called Arab, uh, Arab Street, namely the people in the different Arab states that used to be also in the past, also in authoritarian regime, a very important player that uh, the regime had to take uh, account of, are now becoming a much more important actor. All the Arab government, whether they are new governments that were established on the ruins of uh, the old regimes, or old regimes that uh, succeeded in surviving so far, will have to be much more attentive, attuned to public opinion, to the Arab street. And the Arab street, namely the people, are in the, in, in the different Arab states are very nationalistic, are anti-Israeli, and I'm not going to, to, to analyze what are the reasons for that, but to state it as a fact, and also anti-Western. As uh, Asher has said, no, uh, there is nothing that uh, the, 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 the Western world is doing uh, these days that is perceived by the Arab states as the right thing. And it's also very emotional. 
It means that the engagement of Israel, of the West, with the Arab states will be much more complicated. There will be much less maneuverability space, freedom of action, whether in the military realm or in the political realm. I am certain, for example, that the Arab Spring played a major role in the considerations of the Israeli government during the time of this terror incident that was mentioned uh, by uh, Mr. Silverman. In every decision, every action, there is a stronger necessity now to take into account what will be the implications of, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, the public opinion in the specific uh, state and what, how will it affect the government in this specific state, how it will affect the freedom of action of this government. Well, I said public opinion is anti-Israeli and anti-Western. But translating anti-Western feeling into policies is in many cases very costly in the different Arab states because they have to take into account its effect on the relationship with uh, the Western world financial assistance that they are getting from the, 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 the Western world, uh, other dependencies of different Arab states on the Western world, but paying with Israeli coin is in many cases much easier and much simpler. What does it mean? First of all, it, is, it means that the new reality is a very convenient reality for populists and demagogues in the Arab world. Second, uh, one of the dangers of uh, the growing important of, or importance of the street, of the people, which basically is a good thing, because that is one of uh, the basic elements of uh, democracy, a government that is listening to the people. But the, the danger of it is that it can turn into the rule of the mob. And we have seen first indications of this kind of behavior. And fourth, it may lead to the weakening of the central governments in the different Arab states. And spread of the phenomena of failed states or semi-failed states with all the security implications of the spread of this phenomena. And I think that uh, Yemen is certainly a, a failed state. Libya, I don't know how to, to, to define it exactly at this point in time. I don't know how it will develop in Syria. And the most menacing implication of this phenomenon of failed states or semi-failed states, from my point of view, is the fact that this kind of in this kind of states the governments are losing control over pieces of their territory, which of course can be used then by non-state actors, terrorist movement, etc. Is it all bad? I don't think it is all bad, because. Uh, a, a situation of transition 
is also an opportunity to have some influence on the, on the shape on the shaping of the future, on the shape of the new Middle East that will be born out of this turmoil. <coughs> and I'll give an example which was already mentioned that, and that is the, the relationship between Israel and, uh, and the Egypt. I think that this is exactly the time where a new and closer relationship can be built with Egypt. Because the two parties need, need, need each other. And to some extent it is actually happening. <coughs> so that was the, the, the first point that I wanted to make. The, the, the growing power of the street and its implication. The next comment relates to the major question of what will be the effect of the Arab Spring on the balance and power and the system of alliance in the Middle East. We used in the past to describe the Middle East as being comprised of two axes that are competing and struggling with each other. The axis of the radical, anti-status quo, sometimes called Shia states. I have a problem with this name, Shia states. Syria is not a Shia, a Shia states. Hamas is not Shia. On one hand, led by Iran, and on the other hand, the axis of the so-called moderate, pragmatic, etc. states, and there are also problems, of course, with these definitions. Is Saudi Arabia a moderate state? But that's how it is called. At the beginning of the uprisings in the Arab world, the general perception was that the moderate, the so-called moderate axis is, great, is being weakened and the one that is going to win from it is Iran. But I think that it is not so, so clear anymore. First of all, because the events spread to, to, to Syria and everyone understands what, is, what are the implications of the fall of the Bashar regime, the best ally of uh, Iran in Syria. But not only because of that. Another reason was the fact that none of the forces that are involved in the uprisings in the different states supports the Iranian model or what to emulate the Iranian model. The Turkish model is much more attractive. Therefore, in my opinion, the Arab Spring will sharpen the competition between Turkey and Iran. The two will compete for a position of leadership in the Middle East and may also create a more balanced Middle East in which the vacuum that Professor Sasser uh, explained so well that uh, existed in the Arab world due to the weakening of the, the Arab states will be filled not only by, uh, by uh, Turkey and Iran but also by some Arab states. Because another name that is given to the Arab Spring is the Arab Awakening. And I believe there is some truth in this uh, uh, name because the word awakening uh, demonstrates some hope, something new, and it is a real element in the Arab Spring, and it is having an effect. I was asking myself the question, why was Egypt successful 
in mediating the reconciliation agreement between the Hamas and Fatah, as well as the, the prisoners exchange. Uh, the Mubarak uh, government tried to do the same things with no success. It seems as a paradox. The new government is a weaker government. Why did it succeed? And the answer that I am giving to that is because it succeeded because of several reasons. For example, what is happening in Syria is also connected to that. But one of the reasons is the fact that there is a new perception of Egypt now in the Arab world. And the other actors in the Arab world have to take it into account that a new, there is a new Egypt and it's better for you to have better relationship with it. Of course, whether what I am saying will be realized or not is very much dependent on the role the Islamic parties will play. Once again, it was presented by, by Professor Sasser. What route will they choose? Closer to the AKP model or closer to the Iranian model? I don't have a good answer to this question. I don't know, for example, what is the meaning of Iran in which a Muslim Brotherhood a party is playing a dominant role. Because Egypt, yeah. Because I don't know which path they will choose. It is not clear what will be the effect of the Arab Spring on the Iranian nuclear program. On one, on one hand, it may lead to new thoughts in Iran concerning the utility of having nuclear weapon as an instrument for acquiring influence in the Middle East. Because what uh, the Arab Spring is uh, teaching us is that there are much more potent forces in society than having nuclear weapons. But on the other hand, if Iran will perceive that it is becoming more vulnerable because of the Arab Spring, that may increase the Iranian motivation to acquire uh, uh, nuclear weapons. And last, as a general comment, there are some in Israel that argue that now that the Arabs will be focused much more on domestic issues, because most of the reasons for uh, the, the Arab uprisings were uh, social economic, domestic issues, now they will leave us, namely Israel, alone and be less engaged in the Arab Israeli uh, issues and other issues of foreign policy, including our subject, proliferation, arm control, etc. I believe the opposite is true. Because of several reasons. Because, first of all, it is very convenient for political leaders to use this subject in different situations. Imagine a new Arab government in a state that has to deal with social economical problems that actually are not solvable. They cannot deal with them. It's very convenient to turn to, turn to foreign policy issues. I find it also very difficult to believe that people that are, were engaged all their life in this subject will suddenly deserve them. Let's take a good example, Mr. Amru Musa in uh, Egypt, which is currently the, the, the leading candidate for the presidency in, in Egypt. Those were the subject he dealt with all his mature life. Suddenly, he will become a president and will start to be focused only 
on the price of bread, I don't believe it. Thank you.